Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us here today for our next webinar in our Friday series. We do have a robust amount of webinars happening here at Cal, and um, today we're focused on re-energizing the brain, so a nice time to think about um, how we can keep motivated and, and um, make sure that we're you know, encompassing all aspects of our uh, comprehensive learning. So here we're talking about integrating language with art, physical education, and music uh, still in the home. So thank you for joining us today. My name is Annie Duguay. We hope you're all safe and healthy, and it's wonderful to see um, a lot of the same names and um, from West Virginia, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, New Hampshire, Tennessee, Arizona, uh, Massachusetts, Virginia, North Carolina, Illinois, uh, California, Canada, Vancouver, uh, Iowa, so lots of different locations, Florida, we welcome you all. And we will get started. So as you've just tested out our questions box, GoToWebinar does not have a, a chat box function, but we use the questions box for that purpose. Uh, however, when you put in your response, it doesn't become visible or public to everyone on our list. Therefore, uh, our colleagues are putting little responses back. Sometimes they're going to be just yes or a smiley face, but that makes them visible to all. So we're working hard to make that chat box function as robust as possible. Uh, at any point, you can enter your question or chat into that box. Uh, we do have most of you on mute, and um, we also have a panelist today who will be joining us to share some of her activities that um, she's been using with her students, and that's Isela Ortega. And so in just a few slides, we'll be uh, hearing from Isela. So uh, you probably already obviously registered for this uh, webinar, and our up website is up to date with our upcoming live discussions that you can join. So these are the topics forthcoming, and um, that's where you can register by clicking on any of those topics for our upcoming webinar topics. And then the archive webinar, so this particular webinar will be archived in a few days. Um, so you'll find the handouts as well as uh, if you click on these links, you will be taken to our YouTube page for these archive webinars. And you can, you can subscribe over on the YouTube page as well, or just keep coming to this uh, website here. And uh, we'll promote that later in the session as well so that you have it's a one-stop shop for both the registration links and also the archived webinars. So right now we know you wear many hats and we just like to get a feel for who's joining us today. So you're going to get a poll question. And sometimes you have to search around for this window as it doesn't pop up apparently necessarily in front of the PowerPoint for all of you. Okay, a few more votes. I know some of you are participating by phone or perhaps busy with children or dogs and uh, aren't able to vote. So I'll be closing the polls just a couple minutes. Okay, so I've closed the poll. I will share the results. Okay, so we have a large group of teachers today. I know we've had some varied um, varied uh, participants in our other sessions. If you are an, quote, other educator and want to add your, your title into our chat box, that would be helpful. We always enjoy hearing who's on the line, and thank you for being here today. So our introductions, uh, we wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about arts education. Our previous webinars have included math and science. We'll also be doing social studies next week. So we wanted to take time to think about you know, creativity and um, arts education, fine arts, movement arts, um, computer arts. And um, one thing that I was thinking about in reflecting about this webinar is sometimes I think we think this is 
a time when we might be zoning out to just do some activities that are creative. But for many of us and many of our students, there might be a specific area of arts education that actually makes us zone in. Um, I know my brother is a jazz musician, and when he listens to music or even the subway running in New York City, he's listening to every sound, and he can tell you, uh, you know, what's happening in the minor key uh, within the city noise. So he's zoned in and and tuned in, and so, um, yeah. With that in mind, that's why we're thinking about stimulating the brain and re-energizing the brain, and uh, we want to know how do you express your creativity. So. For our team, I'm Annie Duguay again, so I think, okay, Mary Bell will come first, but um, one of the ways that I have been um, feeling creative in this particular time period is, is these webinars and really enjoying. I have a stack of drawings I've made just to take pictures of for our slide purposes and also arranging for family games online. So who, uh, who would like to continue sharing. I guess we'll uh, just have you go ahead into the questions box and you can see my colleagues Maribel, Maria, and, and Kate have added their creative juices and um, go ahead in the questions box and add in your creative moments in these past few weeks. Okay, so again, you're going to see some of our, some of your responses directly in the questions box. So cooking, meditation, cupcakes, sleeping, certainly can be creative, uh, cooking and baking, playing games. Okay, so my colleague Maria will now be introducing the next section. Hi there. Okay, and so... Um... Let's look at some of the chat. So some of you said that you're journaling and you're making masks and camping um, and uh, playing outside shoots and ladders and, and making, uh, creating those volcanoes on Zoom. Wow, those are fabulous ideas. And, and so we're gonna think about not only what we're going to be doing online uh, 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 when we're at home face to, uh, or in face-to-face -face school situations, but also how do you take these kind of brain breaks when we're in the classroom? And so uh, let's, let's go to our agenda. So today we are going to discuss the purpose and benefits of brain breaks. We will also examine some research on when should we take those uh, be, um, brain breaks uh, during, when we're learning new content, language and literacy skills. We will do that by reviewing the primacy recency effect. Then we will expand on the concept of arts integration and literacy skills. Uh, finally, we will have a brainstorming session where all of you will continue sharing some more of your wonderful ideas to today's topics. And as always, we have content and language objectives. We will brainstorm resources and activities that integrate language with art, physical education, and music in the home. And we will talk and chat about how to promote language by exploring ways to express yourself creatively in the home. So it's time for our second poll. When you have that mid-afternoon energy slump and it rolls around, what do you do? Do you exercise, eat chocolate, take a power nap, drink some coffee or soda, and in the Midwest in Chicago, we say pop, don't we? And, or do you go for those complex carbohydrates? So let's, let's see what all of you say. So again, if, if you're having difficulty seeing the poll, you might want to minimize your screen a little bit and then you'll see side by side the poll as well as uh, the PowerPoint slide later on. Ooh, chocolate, coffee, soda. I know we're, we're always taking coffee breaks, right? I, I go for a cola break. Exercise. That's really good too. Yes, it's very important that we move around a lot too. And when we're at home, I've been sneaking some power naps myself. Okay, so let's see the results. Uh, a quarter of us like to exercise. 
Uh, about a quarter of us like to eat chocolate. Some are taking those power naps, right? During the school year, we usually don't take any of those. We're drinking a lot of coffee and we're eating a little bit. So that's good. We're doing more exercise than eating. And we're hoping that our students are also getting some exercise during these times. Okay, and so as adults, we know how, how to monitor our energy levels and have our favorite go-to energy boost throughout the day, but what about students? At school, students don't get to eat snacks when they want or take a nap or drink beverages. Some teachers, in fact, some school districts have routines that embed brain breaks, which are designed to help students stay focused and attend to content and language lessons. Brain breaks help to energize or relax students. Typically, structured brain breaks last between one to five minutes, build self-regulation and encourages group play. On the next slide, we're gonna see the benefits of brain breaks. Some of the benefits include an increase in productivity. That prefrontal cortex gets a reprieve for all that complex cognitive behavior, decision-making and moderating social behavior that is happening throughout the lesson. Another benefit of brain breaks is associated with the hippocampus. The hippocampus regulates emotional responses and stores long-term memories. A short break gives time for the hippocampus to process information from short-term memory into long-term memory. Having enough oxygen in the brain is crucial for brain function. In fact, 90% of the oxygen in our brain and body becomes stale until we take a deep breath or get up and move our bodies. And how can we forget about neurotransmitters? Dopamine is a type of neurotransmitter otherwise known as our happiness hormone which plays a role in how we play, uh, feel pleasure and helps us strive, focus, and find things interesting. There are four different types of brain breaks. Remember that these are transitional activities used to manage the physiology and attention of the class to keep children in the most receptive state for learning new content, language, and literacy skills. Relaxation and breathing exercises brings oxygen to the brain to reduce emotional tension and are often coupled with stretching exercises such as neck rolls. So why don't you give yourself a little neck roll right now? Okay, so there's a strong case for movement to be integrated into everyday learning, but not all breaks must be high activity as even standing up or stretching adds value to learning. Mathematical activities are designed to promote divergent thinking. A quick brain break might involve completing a math puzzle, decoding a cryptogram, or completing a crossword puzzle. And we demonstrated some of those activities during our digital escape room during our science webinar. So make sure you go back to see how we did that. Uh, imaginary and creative play also, uh, not only inspires creativity and innovation, but also flexibility and divergent learning. Okay, so let's think about... Um, the next slide, there we go. There are quite a, a range of brain breaks, but it's up to uh, each educator to decide the type of routine uh, to use and uh, when to establish those routines. Uh, sometimes even students can be the leaders uh, and they can call out the brain breaks. Uh, it's great for sequencing um, a type of language, right? This is what you do first, second, next. Um, if a brain break is too disruptive, try a different one. It really is up to you about what brain breaks you should be selecting for your classroom. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next slide. The big decision is when do we use brain breaks or even use um, collaborative discussions or group work activity? Let's take a look, a uh, closer look at a learning episode and when uh, for, those, for that exact moment in time when students retain the most information. David Sousa is a researcher who studies the brains of children, including English learners. His research focuses on the primacy recency effect. On the graph, you'll notice that there's a prime time for content and language learning. A learning episode is broken down into three components, prime time one, downtime, and prime time two. Ideally, the majority of new information in the lesson should be presented during the first prime time, taking advantage of students' ability to easily remember information. Students are like a sponge. They can absorb a lot of knowledge during this beginning part of the lesson. A learning episode does not uh, and should not come to a grinding halt 
during downtime found in the middle of the lesson. In fact, new information can still be retained during the downtime, just not nearly as easily as it is, as, as it is during the prime times. For this reason, in order to maximize the efficiency of a learning episode, the downtime is the opportune time for students to practice the new information presented to them earlier. This practice time will give students the chance to rehearse the new information about content and language, making it more likely to be stored in their long-term memory. The second prime time is not quite as long as the first one, but still important in the learning episode. Students are once again primed to take in information, making this an ideal time to bring the lesson to closure, providing the opportunity for students to make sense of the information presented earlier in the learning episode. So what does this mean for language learning and learning new content in subject areas? It means that new concepts and new language skills should be taught at the beginning of a lesson during prime time learning and practice of the new material and skills should be during the downtime. The middle and end of the lesson is a great opportunity for students to share verbally with a partner about what they have learned using sentence starters such as today I learned or say my partner learned. Interestingly, the length of learning episode has a noticeable effect on the proportion of prime time lengths. As the duration of a learning episode is increased, the percentage of time in the prime times decreases. Inversely, as the duration of a learning episode is decreased, the percentage of prime times is increased. This supports the idea that when possible, introducing topics in several short learning episodes may be more effective than a single long duration episode. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. I think it's bring, oh, bringing us to that downtime, right? So we just had our primacy recency, kind of that prime time information. In the chat box, think about this quote. What does this quote mean to you? Pablo Picasso, a well-known artist said, every child is an artist. The problem is to remain an artist once they grow up. So if you can write in the chat box, that would be great. Yes, Kathleen said that uh, it's important for us to play. Sometimes we have so much uh, responsibility as an adult that um, we forget to have a good time and we need that time to be creative. And sometimes the work that we have takes us away from our creativity. Great point. Oh, Martinique shares that uh, keep your childlike spirit. Very important, right? They're always happy. Once we are too critical, we stop making art. A lot of great ideas over here. Oh, wow, yes, I remember. All I, I uh, need to learn, I learned in kindergarten. That's a great book. Children are restricted to use their creativity and sense of play. So we're hoping to bring that creativity back, especially nowadays, right? It's very important that we tap into that emotional side Sometimes we cannot express ourselves linguistically, but we can express ourselves non-linguistically. And it brings out uh, good emotion. Ah, yes, we can definitely relearn how to uh, get back to our creative process. And so now we're gonna hear, uh, you can keep chatting and we're gonna hear from the voices from the field. And we're gonna hear from one of our teacher ed educators, Isela Ortega. Hi Isela, can you unmute? You might still be muted. Let me see if I can unmute you. Isela? I think we might have lost Isela. 
Oh, there she um, is. No, I'm oh, here. Great. There I am. Thank you. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, like she said, I'm Isela Ortega, Pathways TOA with the Department of Multilingual Program and Services for the Fontana Unified School District in California. If you go to the next slide, please. So as we were discussing about art and music and how it, how it influences our students, um, I believe that it, it gives them an opportunity to showcase their voices, their individual personalities, um, making them creative. And it, and it shows them, you know what, there's different ways of understanding and showing your understanding and giving them the, those options allows them to be themselves and to actually have their natural voice come out. Uh, it's my belief that, you know, using a combination of both or independently using music and art, it's going to target, and for me, it's really important, the four domains of language development. Um, and it's going to be through engaging lessons and activities that um, students are actually going to want to participate in. Um, my background is not just EL, but I've also worked as a special ed teacher. And when doing so, I learned that the more differentiation I did and the more engaging the lessons were, my students were retaining language at a faster rate. So now that I do EL and DLI, dual language, I using some of the same strategies to continue doing that. Um, we always talk about how do we teach language? Should it be whole, should it be in isolation? But I think, you know, if we're doing whole and not in isolation, why not use the music and art? Why not give them another venue for them to be able to express who they are? Because we have a lot of artistic um, and musically inclined students who are EL learners or to just don't have that language to be able to express themselves in English, but giving them another modality for them to do it allows them to be able to, again, showcase who they are and show you what they're actually learning and understanding. Um, I also think it gives students the options, you know, when we include music and art to develop language, um, increase, and it is gonna increase the amount of production and participation by students on assignment. Um, currently, because you know we are doing all virtual classes, and one thing that was really important to us as dual language um, teachers was how do we maintain the language growing? You know, what are we going to do? What are we going to supplement? Because we're not there, and we can't be there with them the entire time working on that language. And some of them have parents who don't have the language at home. So we learned that including music and art has really made our students blossom and want to participate on the assignments and they want to participate and continue producing work. Um, again, you know, we want to engage the students. Uh, we, you know, we have to be creative. We have to be willing to go outside of the normal teaching comfort zone, which is something that all of us are experiencing right now. We're all in this new realm of what are we going to do, but it's making us be more creative and like with the quote of Pablo Picasso, bringing us back to having fun with teaching and being creative with it. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is a Wakelet and Flipgrid infusion that I did with my teachers, and we've been sending this through Teams. Um, if you could click on the link, please. You might have not um, clicked the whole URL. Okay. You missed the W. There you go. Sorry, oh my my computer crashed right before we started, so I had to restart everything. Okay. <laughs> In the old-fashioned way. <laughs> so now. Again, so when I sent the wakelet to the parents, we do share this on Teams and we share it on Class Dojo. And as you can see, I put everything in Spanish and English because you know, we're primarily working with Spanish and English um, parents. And this week we were working on las sílabas and we used el monosílaba. So they get a video and they sing along with it. Um, once they've done singing along, I do have, if you can click on the PDF, 
hopefully it opens up for you guys in time. So they get a PDF, they get their PDF, and this is where they're going to read, trace, write, and draw. Because once they're done with this, they're going to take this and they're going to showcase what they've learned, singing along with el monosílaba, um, in one of within their teachers. And because I do work with two teachers, and we want the kids sharing with each other, especially right now that you know we're all separate, they will share it on their Flipgrid now. The Flipgrid is connected to the teacher, so on this one, I won't be able to share with you guys. But once the students go in there, they'll, they've been recording their voices, they're singing along, they're showing us their art, and they're participating. But what's important about this for me is that other students get to see what everyone else is doing, and they really enjoy still having that communication with, you know, their classmates. Because when we meet, that's the first thing they're asking about, you know, oh, did you see my video? Did you like the way I sung the song? And for me, that's another way of us making sure that the students continue producing language, especially because they are learning a different language. And we do have a lot of students that Spanish is not their first language, and this allows them to continue practicing the language. Could you go to the next slide, please? So this is what we're going to be sending out to the parents for June. Now, again, I did say this is for our DLI, but it also can work for our EL learners. So in this one, I, I have something for them. So for example, on Monday, because they, I do have students who are also English learners, they have their skills that they need to practice on for foundational skills for kinder and those moving into first grade. And then on Tuesday, that's where we have our art day. So here they're still learning a skill, but we're embedding it through art. Um, if you could click on one of the links, if you click on it directly, it should take you to the PDF. I think we might have a similar issue. Yeah, I apologize for that, yeah. Um, do you, um, let me try it one more time. Okay. Is there another link here or no, it's just this one? The files should all have links to them. Yeah, and it could be on just on your end. Do you have the PDF that I originally sent out? Um, I don't have it on my desktop, so I can include it as a handout. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. And yeah, go ahead and edit and so that it, um, it meets the needs of your students, because like I said, for me, um, as you notice, we have iStation because that's something that our students are working with and happy numbers. So we want them continually working on the content material in the language. Um, for music, it's um, videos that I found on YouTube that I thought would be good for them. And they're all sing along. So when they put the closed caption on it, the students are able to see the words both in Spanish and English. Um, for Saturday and Sunday, they have a workout video that they work out with. And then we always give them the option that if they want to share on Class Dojo what they've been working on, they can continue sharing with us through Class Dojo. Um, next slide, please. So this is our newcomer emerging um, tic-tac-toe choice board. So this is set up so that if you're the teacher teaching remotely, um, you're able to work with the students and give them options on what they have to do. Um, each of the choices is related to an LPAC task type or to foundational skills. For this one, there was a lot of the LPAC task types because um, a lot of us are getting ready, we were getting ready for LPAC testing and some of our students missed it, but we wanted to make sure that the students continued practicing those skills that they're going to need when they come back because eventually we're going to have to test them or if you haven't, this would help them continue practicing those skills. Um, would you mind clicking on one of the links? Hopefully it works now. <laughs> Oops. So I think it was a compatibility issue maybe between yeah. the files. I'll try. Okay, so that. if you can go there, no, it's not. It's because you put it in, into your PowerPoint, so it's going to your slide. So if you could just slides. Um, I see. Okay. Okay. So if you look, so for example, um, activity one, the student, you know, you have to tell the main idea, the most important um, information from the picture and tech, 
And if you notice, there isn't a lot of writing in there because if we do have students who are newcomers, they may not be able to read a lot of text. So in this one, you can change it by adding text if you have students who are already reading. But if you have those true newcomers, giving them just a picture and giving them like the sentence frame so that they can compose something. So as we're teaching, we're showing them this and we're going through it and we're talking it out with them, making sure that we're producing language, asking them what they see. And the teacher's using her whiteboard and she's writing down all the words that the students are saying so that when it comes to now I need to produce a sentence or I need to produce something, they're able to have words to fill in the, into those blanks. Go to the next one, please. So this, this is where our song and music comes in. Everybody's heard the Baby Shark Shark song. Um, I've learned it because I started working with kinders and they love it. And this is kind of like our little brain break. So when they know that it's time to do this, they're, they want to sing along, they want to dance. But again, they're not realizing that as they're doing that, because we have the closed caption, we're still giving them those words to look at. We're giving them something to see. They're singing along, they're moving. And by using everything, it's it's forcing them to learn without them knowing that it's being forced upon them. And it's a fun way to get them interacting with you. And it's a fun way to ensure, you know, they're going to want to come back, especially when we're doing the virtual learning, because if it's a lot of talking direct lecture style, they may not want to participate as much as if they knew that there was something fun that was going to come along for them. Um, next slide, please. So here's again, uh, this is a comparing. We'll want to make sure we are thinking maps um, school where I'm at. So I wanted to continue with the thinking maps and I give them um, things that I know that they're going to be able to discuss, um, that they're going to give me a lot of language with, you know, even just giving me the circle, orange, um, one's fruit, vegetable, things like that, anything that's going to produce any type of language. But I'm also giving them a frame so that as we're discussing it and we're adding words in there, they know that they can pull those words from the double bubble map and add it into their frames. Okay, next one. So here we were, the, before we left off for our school um, specific, we were talking about the seasons and the different seasons. And, but now, so I went on and I found something and I said, okay, let's talk about the seasons. What else can we learn about the seasons besides, you know, we have winter, spring, fall. So I wanted to give them other words that they could use. And again, we're building that vocabulary. We're building their, we call it their little file cabinet of knowledge. We're adding to it with every lesson. And again, it's something fun and because they love about animals. They love talking about them. They love it. So we're trying to keep everything within the same content of the lessons that we were still using in the classroom so that we can continue that learning going. But we're also trying to make it more engaging for them and by showing them specifically how everything does look. So if we talk about falling in the leaves, um, the bare tree, they'll understand what we're referring to. Okay, next slide. So again, zigzag and you're, we're thinking, well, how does this deal with art? So with this one, what we were asking the students is to do a zigzag portrait. So as we were talking about it, we were saying, okay, we're, we're gonna learn the letter, the end sound ag, and then we're gonna add letters to it to make new words. So the students were saying the word, they were writing the word on the whiteboard, but then they also got to draw a picture and then so we gave them the zag so they could see what a zag looks like. And then a lot of the students decided that they were going to be using zags and they made zag um, borders. They wanted to do zag um, arms and legs because it was something that they were interested in. Again, if you know when we're learning about art, we have to learn about the different types of lines in art. So this is a good way to give them a brief introduction, but using it in a content way. Next slide, please. Um, this is, um, I know some of us use a would you rather, um, I know, but for our outback because students do have to give an opinion and how does it, again, they get to draw what they like at the end. So they're, we're asking them questions about what they could do with it, but when they go to their flip grid or to class dojo to share with us, they're sharing their art because some students are not able to produce the sentences yet, or they're not able to even complete the fill in the blank. So we let them draw it out and even just put labels on the different things. So if they like the sprinkles and even if they, uh, they write the word in their L1, so their native language, it's okay because again, we're, we're trying to build that production of language, but we're also 
giving them an image that they're going to be able to follow along with and understand what is what am I talking about? What am I show? So again, we're making them draw it out, talk about it. And some of them got creative and they're like, oh, can I use uh, one of the little songs that they found on YouTube? And we're like, that's fine. Go ahead and use whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay, next slide. So here's the think about who, what, when, where, why, and how. So again, not a lot of text in there. Just, I want you to know that when we're thinking about something, you know, these are the type of questions we should be able to formulate. So we ask them, write two sentences about what you, what do you think is happening in the picture? So as we're going through the lesson, the students are talking about it, they're learning about it, and they're picking up words from each other. And then here's where we can talk about the colors. We can talk about boy, we can talk about Phoebe. Uh, where do you think this is taking place? So again, it allows us to do a lot of language development and a not so restricted form for the students and the affected filter goes down because they're like, oh, we're just looking at a picture. We're not looking at a paragraph. We're not looking at a bunch of text that I may not be able to understand. And I feel uncomfortable because I don't want everyone to know that I can't read it. This way they can give you a lot of language. You can help them develop that language. And again, and you're reducing that affected filter. Next slide. So this is the, uh, Again, now it's just about them, we, you know, again, letting them, a lot of these notices, there's a lot of um, drawing and singing. It. So just tell me about your favorite season, but you know, we do have the prompts for them. Why do you like it? Um, why, what do you like to do? But we're giving them again, the frame, but there's always that draw option. And with this one, we even gave them the option to have someone you know, dictate the sentence to an adult because they may not be able to write. And if they can't write it and they do have someone they can dictate it to, then that makes them, again, bringing that effective filter down and by giving them the option of the picture as well. And starting with the picture, it makes it feel a little more comfortable for them. And we, I've learned that when we give them the picture, they're more willing to talk about what they write than if we ask them to write the sentences first. Um, next slide. So this was our reading, and this is something that we're working on creating digital libraries. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this all over the place. Um, so the students will be able to go here, but we're still in the early stages. So what we did is just pick a book and take turns talking about the book. But we also give them again that when you're talking about the book, these are the type of questions you should be thinking about within yourself so that you can ask someone else, or if someone else asks you these questions, you're able to respond to them. Now with this one, when we do it with the students, we say, once you're done, again, go to your flip grid and share with us. Um, some of the students um, drew pictures of their favorite book. Some of them just drew the parts they like. But again, it, it, because they're getting to be creative, they're really enjoying the process. That, again, it's our EL LPAC fast types, but they don't even realize that they're actually doing that until we know it as teachers, but they don't know it as students. Okay, next slide. And oh, that's the last, that should have been the last one. Yes, thank you so much, you said I love to see the, the progression there. Um, and I, I know people might have some questions for you and also mm -hmm. might have some creativity or ideas sparked for their own students. So um, we wanted to ask uh, for some chat responses on activities that people might try with their own students based on what you've seen so far. And then um, particularly if you have any activities you've tried with newcomers or students with emergent proficiency um, and want to add to the chat box, we'll take a little opportunity now to, to have a discussion. But thank you so much, Isela. I'm sure um, we'll be having a rich discussion as well on the, on the chat board. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it back to or to Maria to uh, share out some of your ideas and then also a few other activities that our colleagues have prepared for today. 
Yeah, so uh, Isela, you have quite a fan club over here because they're hoping that you can share your choice board. Uh, there are other participants here that have also uh, used um, choice boards and Flipgrid, even though it's new to them, they're very happy to try some new ones. Um, and uh, the click and read books. Oh, uh, the question, Isela, is where can you find a way for students to click and read books? Seems since you were talking about that, perhaps you'd like to take the mic back for that one for a second. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, now we hear you. Yes, Isela. Okay. So like you said, you have quite a fan club over here. So <laughs> Thank you. Number, question number one, is there a way for you to share your choice board with us so that we can actually, so the participants can also have the links or is that a private channel for you? No, no, um, the, on the choice board, no, definitely. I can share it with you and they can um, edit it as they please. And for the library, I, I'm not going to take credit for, like I said, these are all ideas that we're putting together from everywhere finding. So on the digital library, what someone put up was that you add a link to every book and there's different um, book sites like Storyline that has free books. And I've also gone on YouTube and found stories online and I add the direct link because, you know, if we give them the book, but if they don't, if they can't read, it's really kind of purposeless. So I give them the link to where someone is actually reading the book to them. And if you go to um, YouTube and Storyline, they have a lot of books that are easy for students to understand. And we've been connecting those books. Again, once they hear the story, they can go back to the Flipgrid and they can share what they learned about the story without even having to write, it's just all verbal. Wow, that's terrific. Yes, yeah, so, uh, some of our, uh, in our previous webinar, uh, we had we talked about Book Creator as well because you can put your own audio voice in there. So parents can, can actually read a book and then you can share it with the whole uh, class library that way. Uh, so you can have that parent engagement. Somebody suggested Unite for Literacy great free source of books in uh, more than 25 different languages, including American Sign Language. What's wonderful about Unite for Literacy is that it, uh, the, the people that are reading the books actually have um, the native language. So if, they're, if their book is in Polish, for example, then it's a native Polish speaker that's, that is reading the book. If it's uh, Inuit, uh, book, then it's an Inuit reader. And so that's great that students can actually hear people from their own community read books to them. Another great uh, source is africanstorybook.org. Thousands of free books from Africa. Okay, and so I think we're going to move on. Okay. Uh, keep on sharing more ideas. Epic Books was another freebie. SpanishExperiment.com. Um, and so we're going to uh, keep making sure that there are the, the links are visible for you. We're gonna go now to Brain Breaks. And so if you go to stanfordhealth.org and let's go to the first, the, uh, the first one underneath it, the Fit Boost Activity. Uh, this is another great free uh, website. You can download, so we're gonna scroll down just a little bit so we could see the interactive tool. Uh, you have to see this, this is so wonderful. So that where that yellow, red and blue is, uh, there is actually, it's actually a spinner. So if you press let's go, it'll spin it and it'll give you some choices. So it's just going to be a drop down and then wherever it stops, those are the three activities that you can use for your brain breaks. And so we can press the, the timer. Uh, and so you would do your overhead stretches and for one minute, the students will bring their one arm over their head, lean their body, and step sideways. If you want to try for a few seconds, go right ahead. I know I'm sitting down and I'm stretching my arms uh, without standing up and it is just as relaxing for me. And so um, again, if you stop the timer and just press again, it'll shift it one more time and then you have some more choices. And of course, if you rather just do uh, frog jumps, for example, or jump high, then you can do that one as well. The, uh, right above it, there's an activity. It says click here to see the um, activity. Oh, there's a download free printables, yes. Um, so what's great is Sanford um, 
is all about social emotional learning. We've used it before for our refugees in Nevada and our immigrant students. And so you can get more information from there, but all these resources are free. If we go to the uh, Fit, Fit Flow Yoga for Kids, which is also part of the SanfordHealth.org, it gives you the same kind of interactive tool, but now we're doing yoga poses. So now we're actually slowing down and it's going to stop and it's going to say the students can do the cat cow, uh, the down dog, the tree, the rag doll. And so you would just pick and choose, uh, try it again or flip, you know, and, and if you don't like the first one, just scroll down to the second one and do the child's pose, the airplane, the frog and the seated fold. So again, this is all about low prep or no prep whatsoever. You don't need to buy anything. You don't need any other materials. Students can still have some movement. And don't forget, these brain breaks are for adults as well, especially when we're working remotely and now we're just not used to sitting. When we're teachers, we're always moving and on the go. And so this is just an odd situation where we're always sitting. So we need to do these kind of yoga activities. When we go back to the PowerPoint, there's another great um, website called familygonoodle.com. Um, that one actually ha has English and Spanish activities. This one is the family version, but there's also uh, an educated version. And when we scroll down, there's going to be lots of different uh, activities and links for uh, students. And so you just pick and choose whatever you want and it's all free. Uh, the last one that we're going to show you is called Move to Learn. It's from Mississippi. Uh, they created for their state, actually, pre preschool to grade 12 activities. Uh, they're all about movements. And when you go down, you can see that there's a pre-K, K3, 4, 6, and 7, 12. Let's go to the 4, 6, just so that you can see how, to, how they created these music videos for students. Oh, this one's the high school version. Let's see. The 4-6 has around the world. Oh, the one, yeah, the Egyptian one over there. And we'll just play just a few seconds so that you can see the beat. Uh, you can hear the beat, see them moving around. And you could also see the closed captioning because just because you're having a brain break doesn't mean that literacy has to stop. And so if we click on that first video right there to play, then you'll hear the beat. Or maybe we're having some audio issues, but when you're when you're when uh, you go to this website, play it, and it'll definitely energize you. Oh, it's, it's, I think it's starting to think. And what's great is that this is really done with students. So the preschool is with preschool. The grades four to six are four four to six, and the high school your students will be seeing high school students doing these same type of movements. So they don't, they won't feel silly. They'll actually feel like it's part of their grade level curriculum, which is important. Okay, so I think we're gonna go to the next one. It, uh, explore as much as you want at home. You'll have lots of fun. We're gonna ha give this to Maripa. Hi, everybody. Well, you know, one of the things that I love as a brain break um my entire life really was coloring and drawing and i'm not good at it at all so since i can't draw i kind of love coloring because i can still get to play with colors so one of the things that we found out is that there are a lot of benefits for coloring whether you're a small child or an adult you know it creates a relaxed state that can lead to a lot of discussions with your students if you're a parent, why not try coloring together with your child, that it allows them a safe place to talk to you while they're really working on something else. In addition, you might find these sorts of moments, you know, with your child, really good times to talk with them. For English learners, it's a great opportunity to have open discussion and utilize that social language because a lot of times they have difficulty with social language. So parents can talk to their children in their native language or they can speak in English, learn about the vocabulary they're using, and they can all connect it to the simple task of coloring. 
So if we move on, we'll see that there are two different types of benefits that I wrote down here. One of them is for young children. We found that uh, studies have found, especially uh, Dina Pobitsley, um works on the psychology of color, and she's found that for young children, coloring actually helps prepare them for school. It helps them when they're having conversations with those tier one and tier two words. It opens venues for discussion and oral language development. It really helps them focus not only on eye-hand coordination, but on themselves and what they're discussing. And one of the things, you know, we've always allowed children to color, but what about the older students, those middle and high school students, adult learners? So for adult learners, there are a lot of benefits as well. You know, and it's a huge trend now. I mean, I've bought dozens of adult coloring books. They're even on the New York Times bestseller list. But one of the things they found for adults is that number one, it reduces stress and anxiety. It allows you to focus on something that isn't the stress of the day. And it really allows people that quiet time where they can be mindful, where they can think and really rest at the end of the day. It helps the brain like slow down before you're ready to go to bed. It helps improve motor skills and vision. So it helps you focus, which is really important. Uh, number three is on the next slide. It talks about improving sleep. A lot of us are on our computers right before bed. And actually it's been found that being on the computer, being on a screen before bed actually reduces your levels of melatonin, which is the hormone we all need to get a good night's sleep. So rather than watching TV, rather than being on the computer or on our phones, why not sit down and color for a little while in a non-electronic uh, venue so that you can relax and it won't disturb your levels of melatonin and will help you actually sleep better. It, like I mentioned before, it helps you improve focus, but not so much that it becomes stressful. And the last part here is that for our English learners, especially the older ones, it improves communication. As it reduces stress, it also lowers that effective filter that has the kids not really paying attention, not really focusing, not really contributing because they're afraid. So having something that's calm and useful really works well. You know, it allows them to speak to peers and adults about social and media topics while they're engaged in the activity. They can focus on artistic aspects of the activity. So they can talk about lighting, shadows, perspective, and bring in that academic language about art. It uses art-based vocabulary and it connects with their culture. Like these pictures that we have here, we have the American culture of the cup of coffee. Uh, there's a West Indian cultural picture here that they can just express themselves or the mandala that's over on the side. These are all really great ways of looking at it. So these are some samples of the ones from my family. These are from ages six, uh, seven through 60. And the fun one is that letter M there because that's actually a 3D block that comes for people to color and they can color their initials and put them up and they're a lot of fun. We gave you in the handout some uh, templates, coloring pages to take home and work on. And just think about a stress-free 10, 15 minutes relaxation and just enjoy being a kid again by coloring. Only stop and think, adult coloring is a lot more intricate. So I hope you join me and have a lot of fun with coloring the templates that we added to your handouts. And so we're going to move on to puzzles. Who's taking over the puzzle piece? Oh, it's back to me again. And so puzzles uh, in our kitchen, chemistry and backyard biology language uh, and science in the home on April 17th, we talked about creating a jigsaw puzzle for a digital escape room. Puzzle Maker on discoveryeducation.com is another free tool to help students develop divergent thinking and language skills. And so when you hover over the word search crisscross, you'll actually see what kind of puzzle that you're going to make. So these are the type of mathematical brain breaks that can be embedded within 
a lesson and the students won't even know that they're having a brain break. And so again, it's free and easy to make and then you just uh, download it and then um, you put you embed it into your PowerPoint or your Google Slides or or something like that. Um, it's 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 very handy and it's the, one of the easiest free digital tools that I've seen about making puzzles. And so this is where you would write down all of your vocabulary words. Uh, so when we're working on the word wall activities or word bank activities, uh, very simple, easy way to get those brain breaks using puzzles. And so let's go to the next slide, see what else we have over here. Simon says drawing. Hi, this is Kate. Um, Maria, thank you for those great resources. Those puzzle makers are really cool and love everything people have talked about so far today. I have a couple of quick activities that you can do uh, with your learners, either distance wise, or you could give it to their parents as a resource to do or do in your own home. Um, so the first one is art and language and doing Simon Says drawing. So it's a little twist on Simon Says. And what you'll do is take a very simple drawing like I have of this little house here and give learners simple commands like draw a square in the center of your paper, draw a triangle on top of the square, make sure the base or bottom of the triangle is the same width as the top side of the square, draw a small rectangle in the center of the square, the short side of the rectangle should touch the bottom of the square. After you give these commands, you show your drawing and ask if their drawing looks like yours. And how is it the same? How is it different? Why did you draw it that way? Um, to give your learners a chance to talk about how they drew, what they heard, what they were listening for, um, why they put things in certain spots. For a challenge, you can also add the Simon Says component so they would only draw if you gave the command with the word Simon Says. Um, this helps, if you go to the next slide, this helps students practice and reinforce their listening skills. So of course you want to focus on language that you're using with them. So positional or directional language, like left, right, up, down, top, bottom, um, shapes and sizes, comparative language, and of course those pesky prepositions and prepositional phrases. So on top of, beneath, over, around. Um, you can also give a student a chance to be Simon, so they get a chance to practice giving commands and practice speaking. And you, to do that, you should give, you can supply them with the image to start with and give them some sentence frames. So give them things like the blank is on top of the blank or place the blank to the left of the blank. Make sure you're practicing the language with them before you play the game, but it's a fun and simple way um, to get a little bit of art and art language in um, and have a good time, a good listening activity. Okay, so on the next slide, we have another um, quick activity that's called You're in the Painting. So for this one, you're gonna show learners some paintings of landscapes or scenes with people in them and um, have them brainstorm with you some vocabulary related to the painting before the activity. Of course, you're going to want to pre-teach any vocabulary that they might need. And you could choose a painting that corresponds to your lesson or unit or topic to recycle and review content concepts and also vocabulary. So it might be related to a specific time period in history. Or if you're looking at art, it could be an art concept or an art style. Or maybe it's just a painting about a familiar topic or experience. It's a nice way to be able to incorporate art into other content areas. So on the next slide, um, what you're going to do is have the learners imagine that they are inside this painting. So why are they there? They need to think about why they're in this painting. What do they see? And then it's up to you. There's a huge variety of ways that they can use um, this activity. So one would be to create a Flipgrid video explaining their ideas with a painting as a prompt. Or they could have a dialogue with another learner via text or a discussion board or chat room where they're talking about the same image. They could even do it on a, on a Google um, document. Or they could write a story from their perspective within the painting. So you can scaffold this and differentiate this for learners at different levels and abilities. You can provide supports like word banks and sentence frames and stems, kind of like I am blank because blank. Looking around, I noticed blank. 
Notice I use the same um, sentence pattern for the next part. I feel blank because blank. Something else I see is so that you're giving students a chance to practice language where they're inserting um, some of the, their own vocabulary and some of maybe some of the words from the word bank, but they're getting used to that specific type of structure. You can, of course, differentiate these sentence stems and make them more simple for um, younger or lower proficiency students and learners, or you can make them more difficult depending on your learners. Okay, on the next slide, you'll see some of the paintings that might um, inspire, be good for this activity that students might enjoy imagining they were a part of. But you can think of local artists, um, you can find artists from a particular culture, um, anything that might relate, your students might really relate to. Okay. The last one is a me collage. This is just a fun, creative activity that helps your students to have an opportunity to express themselves. Um, and this is good while students are still developing um, language proficiency. So it's a way for them to talk about who they are and what's meaningful for them and, and a bridge to getting to know your students and their backgrounds a little bit better. Where, when they're not able to maybe put all of these complex ideas about their identity into words, or maybe they don't, they don't want to yet. So you would have them create a collage that's all about themselves. And at the center, they're going to put an image that represents them. So it could be a picture of them, or they could draw a picture of them, um, or they could find an image that they feel looks like them. And that's going to be them in the center of this collage. Then they'll cut and glue images that they find in magazines and um, or, you know, newspapers or flyers or, or even photos or stock images um, that are meaningful to them and they'll glue them all around their picture of themselves. Then they can add descriptive words and phrases cut from magazines. Um, and after that, they can present their collages to their classmates and explain to their classmates a little bit more about who they are. They can also make digital collage, collages. You can do this with uh, photos that they have or stock images using software like Adobe Photoshop. So it's a little bit more complex, but it can be also be done digitally. Okay, so I think the next activity is um, for Annie quickly to tell us about. Or... Yes. So um, I'm just going to um, finish up here with a music activity. Um, so the, this was a tra traditional uh, French tune, uh, Ah, vous direz je maman. And we know it better as Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, which I believe was popularized by Mozart when he wrote 12 variations on that theme. So uh, the trick here is, and I'm currently taking piano lessons. So this was my theory homework that I actually had to do a couple weeks ago. And I always leave my theory work for last much as I did when I was a kid. And um, this was one of the challenges that I had. And so I do have in the handouts for you, there is a link at the bottom there. That's the version uh, that I had selected without advertisements. So it's performed by so, and what's nice about it is that, is that there is a um, there is a visual of the playing, and it's sort of like Tetris, where the notes sort of fall and um, then are played. So there's a visual component as well. Of course, you could do it without that um, if you were more, more, perhaps more advanced than I am. So. Here, it's just an opportunity for your students. Again, I think the entire clip that I've linked for you is, is 12 minutes, and um, there are 12 variations. So the idea here, and this is pretty much exactly my, my theory work here, um, to identify what changes in each variation. So again, it's Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. We all know this tune. I think that's also the alphabet song. So is it the melody that changes? So the association of notes of the tune itself the rhythm, does it get faster or slower? The dynamics, does it get louder or softer? And then what's the description of the mood? And this is where I could have benefited from um, the word bank that I provided for you. It's actually a little more robust in your handouts there. Um, and so, and then it did ask me, and this is true, this is exactly what I wrote, what was my favorite? And mine is uh, variation eight, and it reminded me of a tiptoeing Russian ballerina. 
So um, I wanted to share that activity with you, but I don't think we have time to listen to the full variations, but I would encourage you if you're not familiar, um, especially since it's a recognizable tune, it's a little bit easier to hear those differences, at least for me. Um, again, I don't know if there are uh, you know, true answers uh, in terms of what differs melody, rhythm, and dynamics. Um, but if you're not a, a theorist of, of music, it does give you just a different opportunity to have your students thinking about uh, music and again, uh, perhaps zoning in or, or zoning out, as well as, as integrating that language piece of descriptive language. So um, we won't have time to give it a try today, but I welcome you to do so with the handout. So thanks everyone.